Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I am Kathy Grimm and the channel is The Grimm Reader and here I am with my weekly update for August the 20th, 2023. So the coming week will be the last week with before classes start and things are getting rapidly busier with meetings and work to be done and my sort of underlying anxiety has been has been there uh, I ne I'm never a very good sleeper and sleeping is tricky but I'm trying to get into a good routine so we'll see how it goes hopefully the sound is better this week I am ditching my microphone that I usually plug in because I think it it's better without it and just using the phone microphone so we'll see how that goes sometimes what happens is I think I leave it too low when I'm editing We'll see. Hopefully you can hear me. I still am going ahead with Little Dorrit and I'm almost done. I'll be done by next week. And let me give you sort of some sort of as 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 I have been reading impressions, mainly listening and sometimes dipping into the text here. So recently I have over the past couple of years or so I read I read David Copperfield and Bleak House read i mean mainly listened and also dipped into i do that i read and i sometimes look at the text and i'm trying to think which ones i'd read before that christmas carol for sure a couple of times i so i remember i i distinctly remember trying earlier to listen to oliver twist and being thrown off by uh, the darkness of oliver twist especially in the beginning the birth of oliver is just kind of harsh and also i have a deep emotional connection to the the movie that came out based on the Broadway, oh no, not Broadway, the British musical version, Lionel Reed, I think. It was the first movie I went to in Australia as a six-year-old. This is how weirdly specific my memory gets. I remember the kind of ice cream I got in the, in the break, because it was a weird ice cream, because it was, came in a sort of plastic ball and it was, you would scoop it out. And I remember that. And I also remember completely being utterly enthralled with the whole movie and the songs. I could sing the whole repertoire of Oliver. Don't worry, I will not do that. <laughs> Consider yourself at home. I just loved it so much. To this day, I love it. Uh, food, glorious food. And then, I mean, the Nancy narrative and the songs. Oh my gosh. And what's his name? Oliver Reed as Bill Sykes with the dog. I mean, it's kind of eclipsed wanting to listen to the novel or read the novel, which is weird. Anyway, back to uh, Little Dorrit. So of the three, I think it's gonna come in three, third, because I really did love, there were aspects of Copperfield that are kind of like eye roll -y, side eye, -y, specifically the portrayal of his beloved. But there are other aspects of Copperfield that were just fantastic, like the growing up and him walking to see where he finds his um, getting away from the awful family. And also the narration, I think with Dickens, I, you ha I have to like the narrator. And it's not that I don't like this narrator, but the thing that I'm enjoying slightly less than the other is basically everything. So the, I think the plot, it's not as enthralling as the others. I'm just not that into the whole secretive stuff with the with the mother she's so strange so in terms of characterizations what i would say my experience of little dorrit is that the ex i'm peering at my notes here the extremeness of the characters so either they're extremely cold and unfeeling or they're like little dorrit and like completely good and and there's an there's no in between and it, it's not it's not really fleshed out and it's hard to like someone like arthur completely because he's so bland and i mean for reasons and she's so if you compare them all to someone like David Copperfield, who just is a, a, a complete person, or just, you know, just in terms of what I remember, a bit much, but it's still good and I want to get through it and see what happens at the end. So I just still to this day, I cannot imagine. I was surprised how much I liked Bleak House. I like the stuff with the Chancery more than I like the stuff with the Marshall scenes. So, but it's going really well. And I'll finish it probably this week, pretty soon, maybe even in the next couple of days. Moving on to Master and Margarita which I, I'll put a picture up here or of my cat book, which it's not here. I don't have it right here. It, I'm not gonna say that much about it this week cause, cause we're in the final stretches and I'm gonna save my final comments until next week. And this is my buddy week with Sarah from Hardcover Hearts. It's going swimmingly. This is my, it's probably one of my favorite buddy reads that I've had. It's, I haven't had that many. 
<laughs> doing really well and we're having great conversations about everything and the only thing I'll say about Master and Margarita it's the kind of book that is as I wrote here in my notes it's a momentous and thought-provoking read, and it's very, very much, it's very interlayered. There's a lot, there's a lot of different layers in there, all kind of speaking to each other, the different narratives and, and just what he was doing with this novel that he wrote from 1928 to 1940. And it's great. It's, a, it's, it's canonical world literature for a reason. That's all I have to say about Master Margarita. And yeah, I'll be finished with it very soon. Which brings us to my weird little haul, as I wrote here, a weird little haul of mainly nonfiction, and it includes a book that I am willing to send someone because I did the thing that sometimes booktubers do. <laughs> I ordered a book, it's secondhand, so you know, that I already own, and it's exa in exactly the same copy. And when I get to that, I'll just let you know that. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking not many people will be interested in wanting this book, but if someone is out there and you're watching post a comment and say, I would like this book and we'll, we'll get in touch, I'll send it to you. But I'm kind of thinking no one will want it, but if someone does, and then if, if more than one person, the first person who says up that they want it, will get it. I'm trying to think what order I should do this in. I think I'll do it just in the order that they're sitting here. So this was mainly nonfiction. Yeah, except for one book, it's, well, yeah, it is, except for one book, it's nonfiction. The first thing I got was Samuel Pepys's account from his diaries, I'm assuming, of the Great Fire in London. Since I'm heading to London, and so all things London are of appeal to me right now, and I wanted to read about this account of the Great, great Fire. So 17th century, uh, he was born 1633 and he died 1703, and he's mainly known for his diary, or well, that's all he's known for. Anyway, I'm looking forward to reading that. Next one is related to reading Master Margarita, and so I guess I can also so one thing that has happened, just by looking on the internet about information about Master and Margarita, I figured out that Patti Smith, the punk singer, poet, writer extraordinaire, is a fan of the novel. And if you look around, there are lots of websites where she's talking about her her tastes in literature. And one of the other books that she, she loved and that I want to read is Gogol, The Dead Souls. So I got this nice, you know, to go with my collection, uh, Oxford uh, University Press copy of The Dead Souls by Nikolai Gogol, Gogol 19, 1842, self-imposed self exile in Italy. See, I don't really know much about Gogol. I'll have to... I know that he's kind of known for, and I may have even read some short stories, the sort of surreal short stories, like isn't that one called The Nose or The Overcoat? Maybe, I think so. I think he wrote those. Uh, I'm excited for this at some point. I'm not sure when. And now we're getting into the nonfiction. Yes, okay. So these are topics that I'm interested in and books that have been around a lot. I'm always late to the party, don't we know it? And it's sort of through social media and all those things. And the first one is a philosophy professor at, from Cornell who's written this very sort of, it's, it's been around and it's very sort of topical topic of misogyny called Down Girl by Kate Mann. So Kate Mann's an Australian, but she's an associate professor at Cornell. And so what she does in this book is, is she's going to kind of using uh, terrible, terrible crimes in recent history to to do with you know, women, um, sort of dissect the distinction, but what's the connection between misogyny and patriarchy? So the policing of women, the putting putting uh, women in their place and playing them off of each other. And I'm always shocked in my classes. I mean, I, when I teach fairy tales, it's a bit of a secret, but not so much. It's basically a gender studies class. <laughs> And, you know, we talk about the wedding plot and, you know, the mar marriage. Is marriage ever a good idea? <laughs> so the, those kinds of issues come up because it's fairy tales. And if you think of a movie like Little Mermaid, you know, part of your world becomes part of his world. And we have good discussions and I try and keep, you know, as, uh, uh, as open mind as an older feminist can regarding 
I don't, but I'm, I'm always, always very, very intrigued about where these young people are coming from and their upbringings, which are oftentimes very different across the spectrum, of course, as always. But we have good discussions and I want them to sort of think about things in an open-minded way and not get too kind of bogged down in what were their own just realizing. I mean, this is why they're in college is to realize that the world is bigger than what they grew up in. Um, anyway, but going back to, I just thought this was, would be a good time, perhaps sort of heading into nonfiction November to really sink my teeth into this work. Uh, I'm going to take it easy on myself with these nonfiction works because I know I have a tendency to get sort of easily bored with them. So I want to sort of honor that by just sort of taking it slow and sort of being okay with them being on my shelf for a long time and, and sort of working with my own. With nonfiction, I tend to be less patient than with fiction sometimes. And yeah, this is gonna be a hard read because it's, you know, it's about misogyny, it's about um, the patriarchy and all those good things. I'm, I'm sorry I'm being so vague about it. I'll, I'll get back to you when I when I started and when I've done a little bit more research. But I know that she's going to, to talk a lot about, I actually did start it. And the first thing, I hope this, I hope maybe I should do trigger warnings. She's talking about in, even in sort of legal documents, the distinction between strangulation and choking. And uh, so choking is when you swallow something and you choke. Strangulation is when someone does something to you from the outside. And how um, in terms of court cases, it says here, you can train her not to say strangle, but rather choke or better yet, grab. So he grabbed me is better than saying I was strangled, he strangled me. So when he boasts of grabbing women's genital, it becomes locker room talk. Sort of, that's just, that's just, you know, it's not serious. It's not serious. And, it, and of course it is, it's violence towards women. It's violence. It's sort of a tidbit of what, what it, it's going to be talked about in this book called Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny. Moving on into it, so I do have interests in um, kind of leftist um, questioning capitalism type stuff. And one person that I came across, so he was, he was, he's no longer with us, was a British academic writer. He actually had a, and his name is Mark Fisher, Mark Fisher, and I have two of his books here. And he um, had a blog connected to the punk rock scene in England. And I came across him a while ago when I was reading Wege Sebald, and I, re I read Wege Sebald, and I actually ditched, did not finish his book called, was it The Rings of Saturn? The one where he's walking around England. For some reason, maybe I'll come back to him. I was not impressed. I was under impressed, and he was sort of bugging me the way he was writing. It seems sort of like, some people can get away with just meandering and you're sort of with them, like Gerald Monane, for example, <laughs> you can write about jockeys and you're there. But with Vega, it seemed like, okay, you're just making yourself sound interesting and I'm not that interested. Your points are not really hitting home with me. And I found a review kind of saying the same thing. Uh, it was, I don't even know where it was or who wrote it, but I don't think it was Mark Fisher. But anyway, he, he maybe it was him. And so I got into a whole sort of rabbit hole of British kind of uh, theor 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 theoreticians and academic people. Some of them are connected to the uni University of Warwick and he was one of them. And then, then I found his blog and it was really interesting. And of course then it was really sad that he's no longer with us. I've always kind of been interested in his work. So I have these two works for him, Capitalist Realism. I think that's quite famous in, within certain circles. It has a blurb by Zizek on the back and it's from 2014, and just a few, a sentence here on the back. After 1989, capitalism has presented itself as the only realistic political economic system. What effects has this capitalist realism had on work, culture, education, and mental health? Is it possible to imagine an alternative to capitalism that is not some throwback to discredited models of state control? So I think this will be really interesting, not too long. And I just, I kind of want to read his stuff. And then this one's more literary, so it's called, or, or cultural cultural literary stuff, because he, he sort of writes about literature and movies at the same time, cinema. So it's a called The Weird and the Eerie. And what exactly are the weird and the eerie? 
In this new essay, Mark Fisher argues that some of the most haunting and anomalous fiction of the 20th century belongs to these two modes. And so uh, in the beginning, he even does kind of evoke Freud's, Freud's famous essay on the uncanny, Das Unheimliche. And so, and I think that would be more aligned with the weird. Well, yeah, doch, yeah, I would say that's more. It says here, beyond the unheimlich, so he's kind of using these two terms to, to, to investigate works. You know, he, apparently he's going to talk about H.G. Wells and all kinds of other people, Philip K. Dick, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, H. H. Uh, H. P. Lovecraft. Tell me if I need to read H. P. Lovecraft. I have never read him, and yet I, I, I every now and then, actually quite often, usually a male student will be an H. P. Lovecraftian and will you know be really into him. And actually, almost always a male student. <laughs> it's just how how it, how it's worked out so far. Uh, Andrei Kartovsky, Christopher Nolan. Didn't he do Oppenheimer? I think he did. Joan Lindsay, who of course is mainly, well, I know her because of Picnic at Hanging Rock, and Stanley Kubrick, so, oh, David Lynch, of course, oh, there you go, okay, okay. So, all kinds of, kind of, uh, an essay about cultural phenomenon, li literary and, and uh, cinematic. So I'm excited for these two works, and I'm glad that they're not too long. <laughs> and Lily is wanting to jump up. Lily, she's not so happy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm torturing you. <laughs> she wanted to jump up, but she didn't really want me to hold her. Say hi. Hi, Lily. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm torturing you. She's, she's so good-natured, <laughs> even though she's not happy. I'll put you back down, babes. Any, anyway, <clears throat> now, um, just briefly, I wanted to show you my new little thing that I got because I'm going to be traveling over the winter break. I got a Kindle. A nice one and the first book that I've decided to read is because of uh, her love of Master Margarita I'm just I'm going to read Just Kids by Patti Smith I know I'm not sure if I'm gonna like it that much I started reading it and well I probably will but the self mythologizing stuff of her early childhood but I'm I, I will hold withhold judgment as I should do more often probably so now for the the book giveaway but I I am wondering whether ever anyone will really want it. So this is a classic of sort of mm, what 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 area is it? Historical literature, his, history, social science, Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. So Benedict Anderson was a thinking history professor, his or maybe political scientist. His area of expertise is social uh, South Asia. And he wrote this in 1983, so it's not the newest book, but it's about nationalism. And so nationalism in the sense of it being um, an idea more than anything else. And sort of, I started reading the first one where he talks about how tombs of the unknown soldiers and how they're always connected to a nation. But, but in a way that makes sense because it's wars and wars are fought between nations more or less. But he says something over here. He says, The cultural significance of such monuments becomes clearer if one tries to imagine, say, a tomb of the unknown Marxist or a cenotaph for fallen liberals. Is a sense of absurdity avoidable? The reason is that neither Marxism or liberalism are much concerned with death or immortality. But, but maybe not. If the nationalist imagining is so concerned, this suggests a strong affinity with, with religious imaginings as this affinity is by no means... Anyway, so that's really interesting already, and it reminds me a little bit of the person that I happened to write my dissertation on. Boring, but he was an early German romantic who had interesting ideas about concepts of nation and also monarchy and also religion. Friedrich von Hardenberg, otherwise known as Novalis, but um, that's interesting. Anyway, so I thought I... This is the kind of book that I'm probably just gonna dip into, but I wanted to have a copy and I already had a copy. <laughs> so if you're interested in reading this or having a copy, I will send it to you if you let me know in the comments. That's what you have to do. You have to comment and let me know and we'll kind of arrange a, how, how I'll get it to you. And it's fine if no one wants it, then I'll have two copies. <laughs> no worries. Last but definitely not least is a book I've already started to read and I'm gonna take it slow as I said. 
I think it's going to be really good, but it is nonfiction, and it's, uh, and, okay, and I have to preface this with a little story about a rabbit hole. Me and rabbit holes. Terrible. <laughs> I started watching Shiny Happy People because I've always been a little bit fascinated, in, uh, sort of in a horrific way, about the Duggar show and family and 20 kids and Quiverful and all that stuff, fun fundy, fundy stuff. I watched a couple, I would always have to watch it way far away from my husband because he would not want to watch that stuff, which I totally understand. And so when Shiny Happy People came out on Amazon, I did kind of start watching it, but for some reason I stopped and I went down the rabbit hole, the, the Fundy rabbit hole, and I discovered the Fundy snark realm. So Reddit, oh my gosh. And it was actually, the, the, the interesting thing about Reddit is that now and then people who are within the community come on and do an AMA and ask me anything. And they actually, there was this one, ask me anything about someone who was very close to someone in the Duggar family. It's a whole empire of families and connections. And oh my gosh, it's extremely complicated. But this person kept on feeding us with really interesting sort of, I actually saw this happen insights as to what, all the awful things that went down in that community. So that that was hours of my life, I'll never get back. And then I found on YouTube, and she's actually pretty good, and so these are people that p appeared, you know, talking talking heads in the show of, of Shiny Happy People. And her name is Jen, she has a channel called um, Funny Fridays, and she's funny. She's very, she does, she's obsessed with them, and she's decided to make her, her whole thing, her and her husband James. And they take deep deep dives into all aspects of everyone, everything to do with Fundy, and including like a really sad but educational episode about Jim Jones. And there's there's even she's even done stuff about Alistair Crowley. It's actually quite watchable. <laughs> she's funny, and her she started out as someone who she'll do her makeup while talking about these things, and it's just that's her thing, that's her spiel, and she's got a big following on on the YouTube's uh, Jen. Fundy Friday Fridays, but I did sort of want to pull back and get myself out of the sort of because at some point it's just snark and it's not really that educational. It's this obsessive. Why am I so interested in these very extreme people and their extreme lives? So what I did was another person who showed up on the on on the in the show was Kristen Cobus Dumez who wrote this book called Jesus and John Wayne how white evangelicals corrupted their faith and fractured a nation. And she has card-carrying Calvinist credentials. <laughs> That's alliteration for you. She went to Dort College in Iowa. She got a PhD from Notre Dame, so religious but not Calvinist. And now she's a professor at Calvin University, used to be Calvin College. And so she's she's definitely in within the church. She's she's very religious. For, as from someone who's not at all religious, I'm completely an outsider. I'm so I'm so removed from all of this that I I need help, and she's going to help me. And I can already tell. Like the minute you, this is a very popular book, and but she's had to deal with a lot of pushback, of course, from within the circles. And if you look on the YouTube, it's just so infuriating to see people denigrating what she's done here. She's, she's a, an associate history professor. She's done, she has a PhD. She knows how to do research. She knows how to read and analyze. And these are people who, from my outsider perspective, I can already tell these are, who don't really read, they, they cherry pick and they, and they have pre, such strongly preconceived notions. First of all, she's a lady, this lady telling us about Christianity. It's just, it's just, it's, it's extremely infuriating, to be honest. So don't, I don't, don't recommend looking in the, read her book. And she's, you know, it's a history, it's a history book. And so she, there's a lot of footnotes. There's a lot of sort of referencing stuff. And I went back to read the introduction because I did the bad thing where I jumped to this actual chapters, but the introduction's actually really, really good about, and I'll get into it more in more detail, but she's sort of going into so on a very sort of a superficial level, what she's talking about is how white evangelicals, um, what, what does it actually mean to be a white evangelical, who is one, and how it becomes kind of, it's turned into evangelicalism, has turned into evangelical popular culture. And so so you can be, and it's, it's as if some of these people don't go to church. They're not really connected to their pastors. You know, the, she talks about how the, the pastor can tell you one thing, but if you're sort of immersed in watching a certain news channel and, you know, the, the media that you consume and that's all you do, uh, you're going to have your, 
ideas about everything are going to be skewed or at least you know in influenced and it's really really well done i think and i'm learning a lot and then she's going to go into the history of white evangelical uh, evangelicalism and i actually already started it i'm gonna reread it and the first person that comes up who's a really interesting figure and, and um let me know your your thoughts on billy graham who was a card-carrying Democrat all his life. So she goes into the whole how it turns into what it became. And of course, it's it's she's written this because of Trump. I mean, in, in the opening thing, and this is kind of why I want to read it. How did a libertine who lacks even the most basic knowledge of Christian faith win 81% of the white evangelical vote in 2016? That's her, her question. Um, and why have white evangelicals become a presidential reprobate staunches supporters? And that's sort of a question I ask myself too, <laughs> as I stare at my neighbor's flag, which is, it has these colors, isn't it? That's it. It's the red, white, and blue. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I, I will slowly work my way through that and give you updates on how things are going. So let me know if, you know, if you've heard of this. And I also subscribe to her Substack because I think she's doing good work and I think she's a brave woman. She's a you know young academic mother whatever busy lady, and she's being oh I'm being called to dinner but she's being sort of she must have a thick skin or just she knows what she's doing is you know and also she does have faith so that's gonna help her too probably <laughs> and I think that's it for my update this week I hope everyone's doing well and I will give you another update the eve before school starts next Saturday thank you all for watching and comment away and I'll see you soon bye.